Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. It was a warm spring evening. Well, not spring, it's still winter, but we believe it's spring. Evening, those of you who don't know me, I'm Bill McKay. It's my honor and privilege to serve as the superintendent of the Governor Newfield School District. And tonight we're going to talk about our state of the district. But I wanted to start out tonight by giving a, a public thank you to our staff. Uh, we all know the last, the last two years have been challenging, to, to say the least. But because of our amazing staff and everything they've done, whether it be bus drivers, cafeteria workers, classroom teachers, pre-K teachers, high school physics teachers, operations, maintenance, all of them have made it possible for us to have an outstanding two years in spite of all the challenges we faced. Doesn't mean it was easy. They've been giving their blood, sweat, and tears to make it happen. But I want to make sure that we thank them because without them, we never would have got to this point, been able to keep our students in school, keep them safe, keep them learning. And the good news is, sun's on the horizon. Uh, we're, we're hopefully coming out of this, it seems like. And tonight's going to be about looking forward. We're certainly going to talk about some of the work that we've done over the past year, but we also want to look at what's on the horizon and what to anticipate for our district. So this evening, we're going to do things a little bit different. The last few years, it's mostly been either the superintendent speaking the entire evening, or it's been the superintendent, the assistant superintendent speaking the entire evening. And really the way the district runs is with a, a variety of teams. It's never any one or two people that make it happen. When you have a district with 4,500 students, it takes a lot of different individuals to keep that up and running. So tonight we have some of our departments are gonna be here speaking and sharing the work that they do, just to give you an idea of the faces that are out there making stuff happen, making sure teachers are in classrooms, making sure our buildings are open, our driveways are plowed, and everything it takes to have our students here. So the, the, the evening's gonna be set up with a, a small presentation by People Services, our Director of People Services, Avar Tatani. He'll be followed by our Director of Operations, Mr. Tim Ziegler. And then we will have our Director of Human Resources, Stephanie Seifert, share some information. Followed by Jeff Biller, our Director of Technology. And then we will have Dr. Lisa Hess talk about curriculum instruction. Lisa's our assistant superintendent. And then we'll finish the evening. I'm going to talk about Portrait of a Graduate, which is some work that was actually started two or three years ago. It was kind of put on a shelf, but we're going to take it out now and bring it into action and make sure that it gets embedded in what we're doing as our students graduate their senior year. It will all be things that they learn along the way. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Tommy. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. Thanks for uh, everybody for attending. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is Dave Architati, Director of Student Services. Um, so the synonymous pupil and student services. I, I'm just starting to lean towards the title of student services a little bit more. Uh, earlier in the year, after meeting with uh, students, parents, and some administrators, a parent called me up the next day and said, um, my son wants to know why Mr. Architati is in charge of my office. So I'm, I'm going to try to just stick with student services. <laughs> so um, as you probably know, we have approximately 4,300 students in the district. And um, in, in the student services department, uh, which is made up of very loyal and dedicated professionals, we do a lot of psychological services, nursing services, homebound, home instruction, instruction in the home, homeless, group home students, uh, English language learners, GIEP students. Uh, but what I'd like to focus on today is just uh, the work we're doing in mental health in, in our social work realm, uh, special education, and safe schools. And you see the, uh, somebody asked me if I had a title for, for the uh, presentation, Helping Families Break Down Better Education. Um, so that's a lot of what we've done and what I'd like to speak about. So as far as social work goes, we currently have two social workers. They've been with us approximately 18 months since the, uh, we had the closure in 2020 and we started that year with the half days. Um, is where we brought on two social workers. Their primary responsibility is really connecting families and students to uh, community services. Um, that, that's one of their, their responsibilities. And in that, you may or may not know, school, every school building needs to have a student assistance program. Um, and you know, at the elementary level, it might look like um, you know, addressing mental health issues, maybe some trauma situations that a student may be going through. Um, and then we have school-based counseling, uh, malware services, 
Um, we each of our buildings has a school-based counselor, and parents who only have medical assistance could choose to have their child be seen by a counselor from an outside agency, not in the school. And our social work workers really collaborate with our student assistance program and our uh, school-based counseling folks to, to bring kids to services. So that's connecting services to the community. Um, they do that within the building and they'll connect families to, to services outside the building. Um, they, they quite often respond to crisis when necessary. A student could be a suicide ideation, it could be, um, again, a, a trauma situation or just a situation at home. Um, you know, we've had a fire uh, here recently, and, and they really do jump into action uh, and respond to the crisis. And then really, so much of what we do, as you know, is about building relationships. So our social workers do meet with students and, and try to connect with students uh, in small groups and in one-on-one type situations. As far as special education goes, uh, it, 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 it's a big job. We have two supervisors. We have approximately 750 students who are identified as special education. That's approximately 17 to 18 percent of our student body. Um, and, and the saying, and I, I, I do want to read this verbatim, it is the responsibility of the school to ensure, to the maximum extent appropriate, students with disabilities are educated students who are not disabled. So there's a lot of work that needs to go, go into that. First, identifying a student who may have a disability to then programming appropriately, uh, establishing goals. So we do have um, 43 teachers, five school psychologists, and like I said, two supervisors, along with the building administration who are trying to make that uh, all work flawlessly. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear we have we're the only profession with this many acronyms. So we have an acronym uh, that's called FAPE, Free and Appropriate Public Education. That's what we're charged with. We have to provide FAPE to our special education students. Um, and really, we have to follow a two pronged system. And that, those two problems are first, we have to determine whether or not a child has a school age disability. And if they do, does the child require special design instruction? Um, because oftentimes students have a disability, they don't need a special design instruction. So that's kind of what the department, the special ed department, is charged with. And we do have a philosophy of what are general, we don't want special ed students and general ed students. We, we want all students to be our students. Uh, and, and we do want uh, the, the students to be included in everything they do. Uh, lastly, uh, one of the things that falls under student services is uh, safe schools and we currently have one school police officer and when you think about a school police officer and, and you know, some of the other things you can hear tonight as far as curriculum and operations you know it's it's interesting and really we want our school police officer um, not to, to be part of the educational system so there's this three prong you know triangle if you will that, that i like to uh talk school police officer functioning under and that's first as a teacher and then um, we're going to have students who go and become police officers state police officers they want to go into law enforcement and so then acting as a teacher and a mentor is important uh, within the last five or six weeks uh, mr Maloney, our police officer um, was in the classroom in our elementary building was going through uh, a lesson um, I know they did some fingerprinting and, and other sorts of things. So that's what we want to do again, building relationships. Um, we don't want kids to fear the, the police. So I think acting as a teacher and mentor is important. Uh, as a counselor or consultant is a huge part. Um, he works as a, our building administration. He's familiar, of course, with community resources very similarly to our social workers. And he acts as a liaison between administration of our local police departments in our district justice. Um, the last thing is, from a law enforcement standpoint, if any crimes committed, um, if any summary offense needs to be um, uh, issued to, to a student, uh, he, he would be, he plays an integral role in, in that realm. As far as looking forward, uh, so as you know, Mr. McKay alluded to it, we are coming out of this pandemic, it's become more of an endemic. Um, so a lot of us are going to get to change our focus and, 
and thankfully, um, some of the things we're going to be able to do in the student services side is really look closely at our social work, the mental health situation that exists currently, and look to scale, and look to scale the services that we might be able to provide K to 12, um, and really look for some uh, additional collaboration or coordination with not only our, our folks from Karen Foundation and Malware Services, uh, but also you know, within the community. Uh, Laurel Life is a classroom, it's a trauma-informed classroom. We uh, are in year four having a Laurel Life classroom uh, at Newport Park Elementary School. Um, we do have a classroom this, this year uh, at the high school, and it really is a classroom where if a student is coming from altered education placement, maybe it's a hospitalization, it's a step down type of area. It's also an area for students who we might normally have to place out of district due to do behavior uh, or a mental health situation. Um, we, we, we have a class here where um, those students get to stay part of the school community, but still have the, the extra support that they need. Um, so we want to spend a lot of time in that classroom and really get it up and running um, here at high school. And then, of course, school safety is a big part. Like Act 44 is an act that uh, we need to follow for several training requirements. The most, you know, you're probably most familiar with uh, the requirements we have to do as far as evacuation drills. We have safety drills. Um, but there are other things as far as situational awareness, bullying prevention, trauma informed. Um, so there are requirements and there are other things we're going to be looking on uh, as we move forward. So thank you again. It's some of my portion of the uh, presentation. Appreciate you coming out. Take care. Hello, everybody. Let's see here. Hold on. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Ziegler. Uh, I'm director of operations here um, at the school district. Uh, to get started with this, um, I think we'll go with a brief overview of the uh, operations department. Um, we don't really get to talk that much about operations in the school district, so I figured we'd go over just a, a brief uh, explanation of what it is actually the operations does for, for the school district. So uh, the operations department consists of a 50 member team. Um, our teams consist of 39 custodial team members and 10 maintenance team members. Uh, the 39 custodial team members take care of roughly 785,000 square foot of uh, building space on a daily basis. Um, and then in the summer months, our custodial team performs project cleaning and restorative floor care uh, to the buildings. Uh, our maintenance team uh, consists of 10, uh, 10 maintenance team members, uh, and they take care of that 785,000 square feet of building space and 100 acres of the campus. Uh, over the past year or so, uh, the maintenance team has completed 1,800 maintenance work orders. Uh, maintenance team is averaging around 140 to 150 work orders per month completed. And in addition to those completed uh, work orders, they also perform preventative maintenance uh, throughout the district on uh, equipment and grounds. Um, so some of our responsibilities throughout the district are safety, um, building operation of the plant on a daily basis where we check HVAC systems and other systems, make sure they're proper, properly functioning every morning. Um, we use a cloud-based work order software uh, to track and handle all the maintenance requests throughout the district. Um, all facilities uh, related projects, large and small, run through the uh, operations department. Our in-house team also takes care of the grounds uh, for all the sports teams and, and sports and fields prep on a daily basis throughout the seasons. Um, and both of our maintenance and custodial teams are involved in all school activity events and community events that take place on school grounds. Uh, we also uh, oversee the annual energy budget uh, and, and uh, the occupancy of the facilities around the district. So uh, looking back, 
Um, over the last year or so, uh, we had secondary campus construction for phase one. Um, our team has also focused on improving learning environments and uh, efficiency upgrades throughout the district. Uh, so during secondary campus phase one construction, that entailed replacement of inefficient central plan equipment at high school, middle school, Kumru and Brecknock, uh, renovations to 21 classrooms at the middle school, uh, in which um, mechanicals and basic uh, construction for uh, cosmetic uh, issues were, were taken care of, and then also uh, adding upper windows to get natural light into the classrooms. Um, also involved in phase one were group toilet rooms at both the high school and middle school um, and into installation of mechanical equipment for air handling uh, and LED retrofits around. Um, so, so some of the reasoning for the phase one construction uh, mechanical systems at middle school were in need of upgrades. Uh, a lot of those were either 1990 air or previous. Some of that was from the 50s. Um, Upgrades looked at uh, comfort level and then uh, also uh, mechanicals updated throughout the building. We installed dedicated out there outdoor air systems for that building. Uh, those systems bring in all outdoor fresh air and then they're, they're coupled with another system that also uh, treats the air for comfort level. Um, the high school also had central plant updates. And uh, some of these updates included uh, updates to the emergency generator systems so that uh, we were able to cover all emergency systems, life safety, and also uh, IT equipment that had not been covered in the past. Uh, our, our, our department has also focused on um, making, making improved, uh, improving learning environments. Um, so over the past, we have prioritize the processes in which daily cleaning and mechanical ventilation uh, in the school buildings has been uh, dealt with. We've installed touchless restroom fixtures throughout the buildings and our team has improved, uh, has performed updates to Brecknock and Kumru, Kumru libraries. Um, most of these updates at Brecknock and Kumru library uh, were cosmetic and then also included uh, ceiling tile, uh, paint, flooring, and then also some technology upgrades within those, those spaces. Um, I did wanna to touch on a project that didn't happen within the past year, but I don't think we touched on it before. Our staff had been heavily involved in the construction of the Kumaru Elementary School Pavilion. Uh, it was a team effort between our maintenance uh, staff, the Lowe's Heroes and Solution Concrete. Um, the project was designed by Meyer Hill um, and our in-house staff played a major role in, in getting that accomplished and, and Kumaru's been, been able to really use that pavilion um, and, and it's enhanced their learning spaces. Uh, another project that we touch on uh, in the district is uh, the floors. So our custodial team uh, really takes pride in what they can do in summer cleaning. Um, They've started a restorative process for the terrazzo floors in some of our older school buildings. Um, and this entails scraping off up to 20 years of wax and then honing down the stone to bring back the uh, natural color of the floor. Um, in addition to this, at the intermediate school, uh, we have also been starting to remove some of the worn out flooring tile and we are actually honing down the concrete and polishing the concrete. And we're, we're doing this all with our in-house uh, team of custodians and, and they really have taken pride in achieving results that, that can enhance our learners' uh, environments here. As far as efficiency upgrades, um, in the past year or so, we've done LED lighting upgrades to site lighting throughout the district. Uh, and then also Brecknock, Kumru, and Middle School have also had interior LED upgrades. Uh, this is done through the GISA uh, project and then also with in-house staff. Uh, the GISA construction also uh, installed um, central plant equipment that was uh, energy efficient and then plumbing fixtures that were both energy efficient and water savers as well. So looking forward, um, 
in the next year, we'll be looking at secondary campus construction, uh, including the community athletic center. Uh, and then our, our teams will also focus on welcoming learning environments and focus on system efficiencies. Secondary campus phase two uh, will entail the community athletic center, which is currently out for bid. The deadline is three, two. So at that point, we'll be able to see what the bids are and hopefully move forward with that project. Uh, the proposed, proposed, proposed facility is 65,000 square foot um, and houses a uh, varsity athletic sports complex, community center, um, and, and then our, our students at both buildings will be able to use that as their uh, phys ed location, which entails, which opens up spaces within both the high school and middle school for uh, additional learning spaces. Uh, we are also in the process of getting pricing for the spot you're in right now, the auditorium. Um, we're looking at both uh, auditorium and lobby renovations the, and we're out for pricing. Um, also this summer, we will also be continuing to finish up phase one work that was delayed by supply chain issues. Uh, that entails uh, restrooms at both the high school and middle school and then stair towers at the high school. Um, so our operations teams also plan to direct additional attention to uh, main entrances of the buildings uh, during their summer work timeframes. Uh, they will be focusing on cosmetic upgrades and entrances to the facilities, including floor restorations, painting, and groundskeeping. Um, in addition to our in-house staff, we'll also be renovating uh, four floors at the high school and also four floors at the intermediate school. Uh, as we look for system efficiencies moving forward, our team will then uh, begin to start LED retrofitting uh, Mifflin Park, uh, Intermediate School, and the Ed Center. We'll also have controls upgrades for the HVAC at Brecknock, Kumru, Mifflin Park, and the Ed Center. Those upgrades will help to more accurately uh, schedule occupancy without, throughout the buildings and then um, improve comfort level and then be an energy savings as well. Um, our staff will also install continue to install uh, high efficiency plumbing fixtures throughout the district in any spaces that have not yet been uh, upgraded within the last year or so. Uh, in closing, um, I would just like to thank uh, our operations team. Um, without their hard work uh, and dedication and drive, uh, we would not be able to fulfill our GMSD mission. So thank you. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Seifert. I am the Director of Human Resources here at Governor Mifflin School District, and I joined the district in this position in 2015. So I want to give you a brief um, overview of our HR department, kind of what we've been working on and what we'll be working on as we move forward. So the HR department consists of three people, myself included, um, and we serve um, over 800 staff members. About 625 or so are what we would call regular staff members. They have a regular schedule, they're here every day. Um, we also have coaches, co-curricular, um, et cetera. And so with the 800 staff members, our job in human resources is to serve all of those employees in a full employee life cycle. So that's everything from recruiting and hiring through employee relations, benefits management, um, through retirement and resignation. So the main areas within human resources in any large employer. And, and although we're a school district and that is our primary um, you know, focus as it should be, we are actually a large employer within our community. So much of what I do in the human resources world is, is much like other human resources departments in other industries. <clears throat> so we focus on a number of areas. One of the key areas that has dramatically increased across all industries and um, education is no different, Governor Mifflin is no exception, is um, the time and energy that it takes to focus on things like benefits management. So when we think about benefits management, most people think about like your insurance and all of those things, which is a huge part of it and incredibly important. 
as we talk about um, hiring and retaining staff. But one area that's grown significantly in the you know, life cycle of our employees is leaves of absence and absence management. And again, that's not unique to Governor Mifflin and it's not unique to this industry, but it's an area that um, kind of takes a significant amount of time. So, and a couple other areas that are unique to um, school districts are things like clearances, some of the mandatory training that Dave Archimpati mentioned that we would typically not see in an HR department, but because of what we do in a school district becomes an integral part of what um, the HR department has to work with. So as we look through, as I said, that um, benefits management piece specific to like leaves of absence, um, I think the reason that it's important to mention this is that we are a unique industry in the sense that in other industries, someone takes a leave of absence, they're out on a leave of absence, right? And so the work is there when they come back, their colleagues might do some of it. It kind of gets shifted around within an organization. Well, when teachers aren't here, we can't have students in the classroom. So we are unique in the sense that um, even though leaves of absence are not unique to schools or to Governor Mifflin, um, it is unique that we have to hire a substitute to provide quality instruction to our students while our primary teacher um, is on a leave of absence. <clears throat> so the increase in that um, is significant um, in the education world and again is aligned with other industries. So for example, in 2014, there was a total across the district number of seven leaves of absence for that year. Um, in 2015-16 school year was 15, and you can see up till um, like last school year, unrelated to COVID was 56 leaves of absence. So that increase of leaves every year is not unusual, but it is something we have to contend with. And the reason that um, I mention that is that we, I'm sure many of you have heard about a steep decline in our national and state um, number of students going into education as a career path, and then the results of that. So we've been watching this since 2015, when a sharp decline of 66% um, of students go, that had previously gone into education, it declined by 66% in the first year. And it has been a steady decline since. Um, we started implementing here, Governor Mifflin, a number of um, aggressive and creative kind of recruiting efforts over the last several years to try to um, address some of this. And I'm sure you've seen um, on social media or in the news, um, other uh, states, other parts of the country where there's been really significant shortages of qualified teaching staff. We've seen really extreme um, responses, closing schools for certain days, changing school weeks. We have not experienced that level of, of shortage. However, um, having to, we have seen that level of shortage in substitute teaching, right? So um, in previous years, we have managed substitute teaching directly. The substitutes were direct employees of Governor Mifflin. In an effort to increase the number of available substitute teachers, um, we have uh, gone and outsourced with a local agency that specializes in that. And it has resulted in an increase in the number of substitute teachers available to our district. Unfortunately, the number of substitute teachers across the state and across the, the country is significantly dwindled because of this steep decline in the number of students going into education. <clears throat> and that's um, incredibly significant. For many, many decades, students would study education, they would graduate, they'd get their certification, then they would substitute for a couple of years, get a teaching contract, and they served multiple districts as subs, and then they had their career as, as a contracted teacher. <clears throat> that is no longer the case. So students going into education are getting contracts their junior, senior year of college and are coming out of school um, with competitive offers. So that has, so that, that's why I mentioned that whole leave of absence piece. In addition to staffing open positions, there's also the staffing of vacant positions. So as you can imagine, staffing has become um, a primary focus for human resources in all school districts and certainly at Governor Mifflin. Um, so in addition to having to actively recruit for vacant positions um, and new positions, there's also um, a lack of staff, not just in teaching, but also in operations, support, administrative assistance, 
um, those are in direct competition with industries in our local community. So um, if you are an administrative assistant in another um, business, you may be able to be an administrative assistant at Governor Mifflin. And so there's an automatic kind of competition that happens there. So that's not unusual in Tim's group. We've seen that for a number of years in a number of our support areas. We're now seeing that same level of competition within all of our areas at um, Governor Mifflin. So staffing is a significant portion of what we do. Um, in the 17-18 school year for that 12 month period, we hired a total of 87 staff due to resignations, retirements, and normal turnover. This school year in the first five months of this school year, we hired over 130 staff. And that was to address a gap in um, positions that were not filled prior to the school year starting, both professional and support staff. So looking forward, what will be the focus for the HR department at Governor Mifflin? Um, <clears throat> these are the three main areas, staffing, benefits and employee support, and positive focus and recognition. So obviously our staffing focus will continue. Um, we will continue to um, be aggressive in our active recruiting. One of the things that we know that across all industries, an indicator of retention of staff, um, the staff either right out of school or staff that is new to your um, employment is the onboarding process. So we're gonna continue to spend some intentional focus in that area. So the onboarding process is not just that first day you meet with HR and we tell you how great you are and you fill out your paperwork and Jeff's team gets you a computer and that's a key part of it, but then it's the next 90 days. It's how are you greeted in your department, in your building? Are your colleagues positive, supportive, providing the, the support that you need? Um, do you know where to go for resources? Um, is there a mentorship program? Is there an induction program? And we are very fortunate here to have a very strong new teacher onboarding um, induction and mentorship program um, under Mr. Killinger and Dr. Hess. And that has been um, a, a great, um, not just recruiting tool, but great for our culture and for the success of our teachers. So that will continue to be a focus um, as well as focusing on um, support staff or supporting our staff and their needs, providing them with services. So just like everyone in our community, there's an increase in staff mental health needs, an increase in support needs that our staff may have. So we want to, of course, continue to get staff to the right place, make sure they have the services available to them. That will continue to be a focus within the HR department. And then finally, um, making sure that we take the time to positively recognize some of the really, truly amazing things that our staff do every single day. So I know it can be easy to get caught up in the, this didn't go well, I wish I had gotten this email. And, and we can always find fault with everything. And I think everyone here would agree that we always try to continuously improve. Um, but our staff do these amazing things every day. Our operations staff, as Tim said, kept us going last year. Many times at 4.30, getting a call from myself or Dave Argentati saying, hey, this entire building needs to be disinfected. I know you're short staffed, can you make it happen? And they did so that we could have kids in school the next day. Um, we have teachers who are going to multiple buildings delivering instruction um, with inordinate amounts of energy because we have a gap in that content area. And the list goes on and on. So there's lots of amazing things happening and we wanna be sure that we're highlighting that appropriately and, um, and making sure our staff get the recognition they deserve. So that is a brief summary of the current and future focus for human resources and now an engaging presentation on technology. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I have been with the district, uh, I'm Jeff Bittler, I've been with the district uh, since September of this year. So a lot of my work uh, thus far has been uh, looking at what we have technology wise. Um, is this one on too, I'm gonna use this one as well. Okay, okay. so uh, has been looking at what we have uh, currently in our district with regard to technology, uh, making little tweaks as we go along. Uh, those things that are not as you know jarring to the staff and to the students, probably the most jarring was when we changed the password policy right before Christmas. And then I said, okay, that's, that's, that's enough. That's, that's all we can handle right now. Um, but uh, the tech department 
is made up of seven people, myself included. Uh, we are a team of seven servicing the 800 employees and the 4,300 students in the district. And we are a one-to-one -one district which, and, and in every sense of the word. And so our staff, for the most part, all have a device. Our students all have a device. So that's 5,000 active devices in use every single day. So our team of seven services and supports 5,000 active devices. Those are just personal devices. That does not include our labs and anything else that uh, our students may use in the classrooms as well. So we're very privileged and lucky to have all this technology and the team does a fantastic job uh, supporting it and keeping it running as, as best as we can. Um, so coming into to Mifflin, um, it was, it was, it was a, a, a great uh, revelation to me that we were so invested in using our one-to-one -one environment um, as a tool for learning. And so for us, that is our major goal in terms of keeping that up and running. That means access to information, that means access to learning 24 seven potentially. <clears throat> One of the other things that I uh, took a look at and uh, continue to do so is our inventory of, of equipment as well. And so, as we know, the more we use technology as a tool, things age, things need to be updated and improved. And so that's one of the things that I've been looking at as we look ahead in terms of our technology for the district. One of the major tools that we rely on, especially because we are one to one, is our Wi-Fi, is our accessibility as we remotely learn and remotely use the technology tools in and out of the classroom. And, roaming and walking around and doing whatever. We have to have a very integral Wi-Fi network. And the Wi-Fi network that we have um, is adequate. However, it was designed for an environment that was teasing the idea of one-to-one. -one. But now that we are so invested in one-to-one, -one, like I said, 5,000 personal use devices, um, that's going to be one of the areas that we look to improve. The other area that we are always keeping an eye on is the world of cybersecurity. And so, as I talk about in a moment, I'll, I'll uh, mention that to, to a greater degree. So, looking ahead in technology. Typically when I plan for technology, I'm looking at three year chunks of time. But as we, as we start the next school year, the first two things that we're going to address right away is one of the Wi-Fi network, as I, as I described already. Um, that expansion um, is going to include a complete overhaul of our Wi-Fi. Uh, the, the recommended plan for that project will be to go into every classroom, uh, replace the device that's currently there, and then in classrooms that do not have devices, add one. And then we're also looking at community spaces, public spaces like our auditoriums, our gymnasiums, some lobbies, those places where the public will gather and themselves coming with personal devices, uh, laptops, tablets, whatever uh, the, the community, uh, and I mean the community in every sense of the word, everybody, parents, students, teachers, coming together in a space because everybody here has a device and they want to be able to get it and access it and so that is, that is one of the services that we are going to look to improve and update district-wide. And then cybersecurity. So it's important to understand first what we mean by what cybersecurity is. Cybersecurity is a tool that is, any tool that is used to protect the users and the welfare of the network. So that can mean software, it can mean hardware, but more importantly, it means looking at our policy and our practice. The cybersecurity that we put into place is meant to protect our users, like I said, but it is our users that can also be the very thing that puts our cybersecurity to detriment. So making sure that our staff is trained, that our students are aware that there is awareness of cybersecurity and things that can be harmful to the network, that's going to be just as important and continuous year over year as we, as we continue to improve that. And then in, in addition to that, we add that IT layer of software 
antivirus software, spam, uh, anti-spam software, and then hardware as well. Things like our firewall, the, the way our staff accesses the network, the way the students access the network. Um, and then once they've accessed the network, how are they filtered? How are we monitoring that activity? And how are we continuing to keep them safe? So those things we will continue to update uh, for next year, especially. As we look even further beyond next year, we're going to look at other things uh, with regard to uh, cybersecurity, especially. Um, one of the hot, hot topics right now in any organization is something called uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, some of you may already be using this now, where if you access your bank account and it immediately texts you back a code and you get to re-enter that code so that the bank knows, okay, this is absolutely you that is accessing the account. Well, it's something very similar. We can make it less complicated for a school district, uh, but, but that type of security is starting to kind of peak its way into school districts. And so we're definitely gonna be taking a look at things like that. Um, but again, our main goal is access, access to teaching, access to teaching and learning and resources. So even though we implement these things which sound complicated, the eye is going to be always on how do we make it smooth? How do we make it easy? Because we have uh, users of all ages. We have kindergartners and we have 18 year olds and then we have adults. So we have to make it accessible for everybody. That's it. Good evening, I'm Lisa Hess. I serve all of you as assistant superintendent. And uh, I am a Mifflin graduate. I went to go to Mifflin K-12. Uh, I was a teacher here, a principal here, director of teaching and learning. And so curriculum instruction is really near and dear to my heart. And I really wanna give our students the best experience that they can have in terms of curriculum and instruction. So we're gonna talk about where we have been where, we're current, where we are currently with curriculum and instruction and where we're going. So with the 2020-2023 comprehensive plan, we set some goals. And one of those was to develop a K-12 standards-based framework that was vertically and horizontally aligned. And I'll talk about the fact that we've done some of that work and we're continuing to do that work. We wanted to develop a rigorous, relevant, and future-focused curriculum aligned to state, academic, and career work standards in every content area. And we are doing that in several different ways. Also, to create student-centered instructional practices and have them used by every stakeholder in the district. And so where we've been is uh, we started with the ELA. We implemented units of study, um, K-8, to in reading and writing. And with units of study reading, students have voice to voice. They get to choose what they read. Um, they get to have high quality, um, high interest, um, just write books on their level. But they're also getting direct instruction to push them further um, so that they grow and learn as a reader and know what it is uh, to be a proficient reader. In writing, they go through the writing process. They learn how to write for authentic audiences. And they also get that direct instruction to teach them how to be a proficient writer. A few years ago, uh, I think it was two and a half now, we piloted three different math resources. We had a team of about 14 teachers and a couple of administrators, and we took a year and a half to really look through three different math resources and what would be best for both our students and our teachers. And so uh, we decided on Ready Math, and we are currently using Ready Math and iReady. Ready Math really focuses on student collaboration and student discourse about how they answer the questions and that there can be multiple ways um, to correctly answer a problem. And I really gives our teachers the data that they need to pull small groups and to give students individual attention in the very specific gaps that exist for them. We also um, updated and completed our math and ELA curriculum framework. So that first um, goal that we had for our comprehensive plan, that was part of it, that's where we started. And so that math and ELA K-8 framework is completed. So where we are currently, um, we've implemented two project lead the way courses and we implemented those through grants that we received. 
to get to apply for and receive. The first one is the green architecture at the middle school. You may have seen some of the students out there showing their projects and how they um, have developed different ideas for uh, buildings and houses. Environmental sustainability at the high school. That's a new course, and that's a project lead the way course. Um, and Melissa Azarello in our science department leads that. We added a computer science uh, class at the middle school. We developed, we're currently developing social studies and science curriculum framework, and our director of teaching and learning, Mr. Chris Pillinger, is working with our department leaders and our teachers in the development of those two different curriculum frameworks. We implemented I Ready Reading, the diagnostic. The diagnostic will help us identify specific gaps in reading that we can uh, assist our kids in uh, filling. And uh, it also helps our teachers, once again, through small groups and meet individual student needs. We're currently looking at a new math resource for our Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry courses. Internships and school to work. Uh, we are currently really, uh, we have a lot of kids in, in both of those. And it looks like we'll have over 100 kids in our internship program for next year. So that's really, really growing. Um, and it, because it's really relevant to our students and it's what they want to do, um, they really are interested in pursuing the internship as school work programs. We have 18 teachers and one administrator who are involved in the Science Research Institute through Albright College. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, Science Research Institute, we also have 22 students who are on a grant who uh, participate in that in the summer and also have the ability to participate in their after school program. So the Albright Science Research Institute was started about eight years ago by a science teacher at Conway Weiser, Adele Shea. And Adele was doing her doctorate work down in Philadelphia. And she saw the access that students in the city had to research equipment. And she thought, wow, there's so much talent in Berks County where I am. Students need to have access to this. So she started the program at Conway Weiser and then thought about, hey, let's expand this countywide because our county really needs talent to be developed here and to stay here. And so the Science Research Institute at Albright was born and it is the programming. It's an educational philosophy and it's, it's research-based work that can be done in any content area. And students bring their own creativity, innovation, and passion to it. And they focus on a problem that they are interested in, that they want to solve. And they do the research, they connect with uh, professionals, um, and they uh, write to get equipment to support their work, and they learn all kinds of skills. Um, and I'll talk about those later as well, um, including communication skills, literacy skills, research skills, and most importantly, entrepreneurial thinking. So a part of SRI is TEL, and that's Total Experience Learning. And that's the instructional model. That's what our teachers are learning about um, as they're going through the courses. And that involves student agency, critical thinking, characteristics of entrepreneurship, and characteristics of innovation. And that's what our teachers are focusing on, using that within their curriculum to assist students uh, to be able to follow their passions and figure out really what they want to do um, in their career path within any content area. So what they do is unlock the creativity of the students, nurture that curiosity, build their confidence through that the iterations of failing, but getting back up again, questioning, and um, doing better the next time. Um, this is really something that will contribute to the local community because they do connect with uh, business owners and organizations, and they develop that intellectual activity um, to think forward about um, developing things such as patents. So the World Economic Forum um, listed the top 10 skills of 2025 that our students need. And it's broken down into problem solving, self-management, working with people, and technology use and development. Well, SRI goes beyond that. These are all the skills that our students are learning when they are in that program or when they are in classes with our teachers who have been trained. And so it goes above and beyond anything that was listed previously. What's really important is the connection to our community and our business owners. 
and bringing students back here to start their businesses. So in 2019, Brookings Institute did a study of Pennsylvania and the innovation and economic growth um, that goes on here. And they questioned where is the research and development occurring in Pennsylvania? And what they found was it's in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and State College, so major areas. But only 1.5% of the rest of the state has research and development occurring. And that's for a Delaware idea. We need to expose our students to more research and development. They have such talent and they can bring it back to our uh, county and start their businesses here and, and grow them and stay and support our economy here. So the rest of the state is what we call the spaces in between, that where research and development does not exist, but that SRI is trying to create. And over time, SRI is going to be something that Berks County is going to be very proud of, and they'll, they'll reap the rewards um, in, in several years, because it's really, really going to help the economy. So I've got the Midland TLL, TEL, and SRI implementation starts in grades K to four, where we will teach uh, SRI skills to our students. In grades five to, to 10, um, grade five is where students really have their creative peak in their brain. And so that's where we'll feed that creative time and continue to build those SRI skills. And then grades 11 and 12 is where students really kind of dive in. They can dive into the research projects before that. This is something where they could go half time at government on high school and then half time at Albright College to work on the research projects based on their own passion. So uh, there are several different patents that students have already created. Um, there's a, a group of students created a patent where they um, took chicken manure and they created glass jewelry out of that. Um, so that was something that, that, you know, they put together in their mind um, and they knew they could um, solve the problem. The uh, agriculture secretary came and did a seminar and said, chicken manure is really a problem. And so these students were like, well, how can we solve that? And so what they did was turn something uh, great, something uh, last jewelry out of chicken room, uh, which I, I can't even imagine the thought process that went into that. So where are we going? Um, we're really going to identify and implement a new math resource uh, for algebra one, two, and geometry. But we're taking our time because it's really important that we pick the right resource for our teachers and for our students. Uh, Mr. Killinger is going to complete the social studies and science framework, uh, K-12, with our science and social studies teachers and our leaders. We are looking to increase our internship and school work opportunities. And the Science Research Institute, we're going to start in a, a new cohort in fall 2022. We're going to increase uh, the students that are able to go in the summer, this summer in 2022. And we have nine principals and administrators who are going to be trained in SRI and TEL so they can support those teachers in their work and their passion. So everything that we're doing is to bring a more authentic experiences for our students, meaningful experiences for our students in the classroom and uh, through their instruction and also through the curriculum. So thank you for coming tonight. Really appreciate it. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. It's not over yet. We get the last piece. I'm going to make everybody look over this way now. So switch your heads and wake everybody up. So, Portrait for Graduate, this is something that started two years ago. And the pandemic hit, and we just sort of put it on a shelf. And we didn't do a whole lot with it. And we were um, at a workshop. It was actually six different workshops over the fall and the winter with a team of administrators. We we're meeting with other districts from around the county and around the eastern part of Pennsylvania. And, you know, we, they started talking about what great school systems do differently to be high performing, not only in our country, but in other countries. And they started talking about a portrait of graduate, like, hey, we, we've got one of those. We were one of only two of the three schools that actually had one built. But we hadn't done anything with it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dust it out and, and we're going to start working on it again. It was created with the Focus 2020 group. Some of you may have participated in that. It was a large group that got together in 2020, students, community members, staff members, board members, and worked over the course of several months. They, they met and created our comprehensive plan, really, but a byproduct that came out of that was this idea of a portrait of a graduate, which is really like a contract that we, that we would have with families saying that when your child graduates from Governor Mifflin, 
They get the diploma, and the diploma says that they earn these credits and they learn all this content. But we also wanted to have this, this contract that says, and, and as a portrait of a graduate of Governor Mifflin, they also got all these skills. And a lot of the skills have to do with um, ones that you'll hear called soft skills. I don't think that's a good name for them because I actually think many times they're more important than the content skills that our students get. Future ready skills, the things that are going to serve them when they graduate, regardless of what they do, whether they go into the military, whether they go into the workforce, whether they go on to do some post-secondary education, those skills are going to help them, help them in jobs that don't even exist today, that they'll work in, in 10 and 15 years. So this was put together and it, it's a list of categories and then the components within the categories that we're going to start making sure all of our students have by the time they graduate. I'm just going to give you a kind of a 30,000 foot view of, of those and then kind of tell you where we're going to go with it. One of the categories is citizen and within the citizen, we want to make sure our students are informed citizens, involved, community minded, responsible and global. Next category is literate. And then within that, we want to make sure that they have academic literacy, social emotional literacy, they're digitally literate, especially in this world of technology, financially literate so they're securing their life, and culturally literate so that they can interact and support others as they go through the world. Another category is competent. We want to make sure they're critical thinkers, creators, communicators, collaborators, and ethical leaders. Again, those skills they'll need to be successful in life outside of school. Self-aware. Make sure they have a balanced life. They're healthy, both socially, emotionally, and physically. Relational, that they can create relationships with others. Advocate for themselves and for others. And empathetic, to be able to support and help and understand other people. And finally, lifelong learners. What does that mean? To be curious, to be resilient, reflective, adaptable, and courageous, and make sure they have those skills. So this is the document that was put together. Obviously, all those categories are linked together. None of them stand alone. They all have to be interconnected. And the components are all listed at the bottom. The work to be done are our next steps and what we're going to make sure we accomplish by the end of next school year. We're going to go back to this list. We're going to review it and revise it. We've learned a lot over the last two years. There's a lot of things that maybe two years ago didn't seem so important that seem really important today. So we'll go back and add some of those pieces to it. We're going to define all those terms. What does it mean to be an advocate for yourself and to others? And that means something to different people. So we've got to get the definitions so everybody knows what we're talking about across the great levels and across our community. And then finally, we're going to make sure that those skills get embedded from pre-K through 12th grade. So first graders can absolutely be advocates for themselves. That looks a lot different than what a fifth grader does when they advocate for themselves. So we're going to make sure they have those opportunities to experience that, learn it, and model it as they come through the grades. So when they graduate, we feel secure that they have all of these skills when they go out into the world. So that's kind of a very quick portrait of the graduate information, but it is going to be a bulk of the work that we do. We will definitely weave it in. We have to start another comprehensive plan here um, within the next year, and we're definitely going to weave it into that. We want to make sure that this is a place by the end of next school year so that we can say that every graduate that walks out of Governor Mifflin is getting their diploma and they're getting all of these skills that they'll take out with them to be successful in the world. The last two pieces we have for this evening, Tim talked a little bit in the operations about our building project. That's obviously a, a huge piece of what's going on in the district. We, we devoted the majority of last year's state of the district to the building project. Phase one is, is pretty much complete. We did a lot of the HVAC, the wiring, the inside, the infrastructure of the middle school and the high school, and actually some of the other buildings also. We're going into phase two. We have, we're out to bid right now for the components in phase two for the community center and the athletic center. Those will be coming in in March. And then once those come in, we'll get back to our regular building updates that we do in each of our work sessions and our board meetings. And put this up here so you realize there is a district webpage for our building project. It explains all the phases, it explains the entire budget to the project, and it actually also gives you a link if you have any questions related to the building project. So you can visit that at any time. You can submit those questions at any time, and we will get back to you with answers related to anything involving the building project. And finally, as you go through tonight, you think you say that the district, we haven't mentioned anything about money. Well, that's because on April 27th, we'll have a budget town hall meeting that will be specifically about our budget. And our CFO, Diane Richards, will, will dive into the budget, explain all aspects of the budget, and you can ask any questions related to the budget. We would ask that you submit those questions ahead of time. 
And if you go to our district's webpage, go to the town hall budget meeting, there's a link there. You can submit any budget question you have. We'll make sure that we include it in our presentation. We have the town hall budget meet on the 27th, and that'll be at the government from intermediate school. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. We appreciate your attendance. Have a safe trip home and enjoy the rest of your evening.